All right. Good deal. So, hey, guys, my name is Jordan Tong, um, and most of you all that are on this call are part of our uh, elite BSC uh, mastermind group. We call it our BSC tribe um, of business owners in the commercial cleaning industry that are uh, anywhere from half a million dollars up to, you know, some of you guys are 10 plus million dollars in revenue. And so last year and in previous years, we did webinars once a month. And this year we, we sort of shook up our format a little bit and are providing uh, some educational content every week and then doing these webinars about once a quarter. So today what we're going to be doing is I've got a, a special guest with me today, Stephen, um, and I'll introduce him here in, in just a minute. Um, and we're going to be answering your questions. So we, we had a, a handful of questions that were submitted uh, to you guys or to me by you guys. And, um, and we're going to be go working through some of those. They're all really relevant and pertinent questions. Um, and so we're excited to do that. So a, a couple quick uh, maybe housekeeping notes here. So um, several of you uh, that are on here are are new to our mastermind group, and I just want to to make sure you get uh, you know maximum value. Um, we have um, our peer networking, so so our base camp portion of of the mastermind group. I know a lot of you guys are on that. Um, it's a place for you to post questions and get feedback from others that are that are members in the group. It's a, a place uh, to learn and share challenges and encourage one another. It's probably, you know, as much as I like to think I add value to the group, it's probably the thing that matters the most to everyone. Um, so I, if you're a member of the group, I'd encourage you to, to partake in the base camp portion and get to know people and ask questions. Um, th there's just nothing more valuable than having the insight and opinions of a hundred plus business owners in the industry. Um, so also we're going to be, we send out educational or training videos every week. There's, there's a, um, we go through a cycle of, we do a sales and marketing video one week and an operations video and HR slash culture video another week. Um, and then an admin finance one along with resources with each one of those, uh, videos that come out. So be looking for those in your inbox. I also post those on Basecamp. And then there's a, a course library is what I call it, where all of this stuff is cataloged and you have access to that. And I send that link out almost every week along with the, the content that you get. And then lastly, if you guys want any one-on-one -on -one coaching to, to help you in growing your, your cleaning company, uh, I'm more than happy to oblige and, and chat with you. We can schedule a Zoom call. Um, and I do that several times a week with different folks in our group and it's, it's a lot of fun and, and we can usually help you push the ball down the field and, and move your company in a direction that, that you'd like to get to. All right. So, um, if there's any other questions about the group, okay. So if you're, an, if you're not a member and would like to learn more, I'll send out an email when this is over with, with links to the mastermind group. And if you have questions about using Basecamp, which is the, the, the peer forum that we use, if you have questions about the training content or coaching, you can reach out to me, you can shoot me an email. Um, and if you're not a member of the group and like to check it out, I'm happy to talk to you about that and can send you info, um, <clears throat> about that as well. Okay, so last um, thing here before we get started, um, we are hosting a sales strategy workshop um, in June, from on June 16th through the 18th. So we have done two, we've actually done four workshops, um, and two of them have been sales workshops. And both of those, we've actually sold them out, and you know we cap our attendance there at about 35 people. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. We walk through basically the whole sales process from beginning to end from soup to nuts. So, uh, so that you can walk away and, and have a plan that you can put into place when you get back to help you grow, um, sales in your organization. So I will, in addition to, um, uh, information about the group, I'll send out information and email about this. Um, we've got room for, for several more folks. This one hasn't filled up as quickly, um, mainly because a lot of people have already attended. Uh, but we're excited to, to get this one um, filled up. This will probably be our last uh, sort of 101 sales workshop that we'll do for a considerable amount of time. Um, later on in the year, our plan is to do a, um, a bidding and estimating and sales proposals workshop. So that's something to be looking for later on in the year. All right, so just a, a brief overview. Uh, we've we've had so many folks join our group recently, and we've got some guests on here. So I just <laughs> I'm gonna give you just a, a brief overview about myself to introduce myself. My name is Jordan Tong. 
I'm one of the owners here at France Building Services. We're a janitorial and maintenance company. We're based out of Kentucky. Uh, we've got um, offices and operations in Indiana, a couple of different cities in Indiana. We've got um, a few operations all throughout Western Kentucky, and we have some operations down in Tennessee um, as well. So uh, I joined the company in 2007, and we were probably doing about one and a half to two million dollars a year in revenue then. Um, and this year we'll probably finish close to the the 19 to 20 mil uh, number in total revenue. Um, so a, about three or four years ago, I started uh, Elite Business Coaching, which is a group dedicated to helping folks like you in the industry, owners um, and leaders in the industry. I've spoken at, at multiple uh, BSCI events. And my education background is civil engineering, but I never used that. So um, I went from a math guy to, to cleaning toilets. So uh, it's a glamorous career journey, but uh, but it's been a good one. So Stephen, are you on the call, man? Yeah. All right, good deal. So Stephen, I'm going to introduce you, and if I leave anything out or am unfair to you, so um, uh, I will let you know. Um, so Stephen has been with the co company for about 10 years, um, maybe not quite that long. Um, but Stephen started as a area supervisor with our our organization. Um, overseeing a third shift uh, job, probably one of the crappiest positions you could have. <laughs> uh, and um, and then I guess moved up to an area manager, then a branch manager, and now Stephen oversees our uh, a large portion of our Kentucky and, and Tennessee operations. Stephen, how much revenue do you oversee now? Uh, so annually, probably more than that 10 million mark, because yeah, it's uh, a little over half of our company, so yeah. About ten million. Okay. Okay. Man, your audio is a little a little rough. I don't know what's what's Can causing I, that. Can you hear me any better now? Yeah, that sounds a little bit better. Okay. Sorry, that sounds so a lot better there. About ten million. Okay. And Stephen is a family man. Loves to fish and camp and um and uh so Stephen and I have become good friends over the years and he's actually my workout partner so um so we have a good time together so Stephen let's just dive right in um so questions um that that came in and these these questions will be sort of all across the board um um the, the first question is what key numbers and percentages are you looking at on your P&L? So as you look at your, your P&L every month, and, and one of the, the, the thrust of this question was, is like, you know, is there any industry standards that we should be looking at in terms of profit and that sort of thing? But as, as a regional manager and you're looking at your branches, what are some of the key things that you're looking at to determine how well you guys did? Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve -o. Hey, man, I am having some trouble on your audio here. Um, I'm gonna send somebody down to see if they can help get that uh, figured out, and then we'll. I'll get you back on. Okay, so I'll I'll go ahead and answer this question uh, here myself. So. In terms of industry standards, I'll, I'll sort of start there, and then if Stephen gets back online, um, we can we can go with him there. So, in terms of um, industry standards, the the first one that I'm looking at is going to be profit margin. Okay, so that's that's going to be the first thing that I I guess <laughs> for right or wrong, that's it's typically where we always go. We go straight to the bottom line, and we're um, looking at you know how do we end up. So early on, when when we um, when we first started um, growing, when we were in that one to two million dollar range, our percentages were actually pretty low. So typically, what happens in early on in a company, in the you know the zero to one to two million dollar range, usually percentages can be pretty high. So you're profiting a lot, but the owner is doing a lot of stuff. 
um, as well, wearing a lot of hats. And so typically the profit margins are a little bit higher there. And then as we started to grow and started adding management and, you know, management layers in the organization, our profit numbers dipped pretty low. And I've shared that if you actually come to our operations workshop, we talk about that in, in pretty great detail. There was there was a period of years where we were averaging two and three percent margin. So it's just it's razor thin. And it was it was not good. And um, so if you look at the results or the statistics that come up from the BSAI and, um, you know, other metrics from the industry, um, you know, somewhere in, in, and we're talking EBITDA. OK, so earnings before interest tax depreciation, that sort of thing. Um, the, those numbers are typically going to be around the 6% range. Okay. So that, that's going to be your average. So if we're looking at an industry standard for, um, for profit margin, you're going to be in that range. So we were below that for a time. And then we started hitting, you know, between five and 7% on the regular. Um, and then over the last few years, we've, we've been able to push that up to 10 plus percent. Um, so Dana Weaver, who's a consultant in the industry and someone that I had, had talked with and had, he had helped consult with us many times, um, their company sort of had a similar trajectory. Um, and, and I think at their, their peak, they were hitting around 10 to 12% EBITDA in terms of their, uh, in terms of their profit margin. So Steven, are you back on now, man? Uh, yeah. Can you guys hear me any better now? Yeah, man. That sounds a ton better. That sounds okay. A ton perfect. Better. Sorry about that guys. Yeah, no, no worries, man. So what, what numbers are you looking at Steven on, on your P and L's each month at the branch level? Yeah. So again, um, just, uh, and I, I don't know how much of what I said earlier you could hear, but I'll, uh, I'll just kind of start back over. Uh, but again, this may seem a, a little odd and, and simple, uh, but, I'm, I'm looking at actual revenue versus budgeted revenue. And, and specifically what I mean by that is what percentage of each revenue category make up the total. Um, so an example of that would be at the beginning of each year, uh, we, we set certain goals um, for, for our company. And one of those goals uh, was that we want to be at 10% of our overall revenue um, with additional services income, right? So I'm, I'm tracking that regular just to make sure um, that that's, that's where it needs to be. Um, another, uh, another example of you know, the actual revenue versus budgeted would be our product resale. Um, a goal that we had set was that we wanna be at about 5% by the end of the year um, of total revenue, which would, um, which would be product resale. And currently we're at about 2%, so we've got quite a ways to go there. Um, but um, Direct labor percentage in this business. I mean, you guys know um, direct labor percentage is what's going to drive the needle one way or the other. Um, when your labor's high, your profit margins are going to be low. Uh, so we we try to to to, to nail down um, what percentage of of our revenue do we want to spend on on direct labor, and for any given branch, and we try to make sure that this doesn't. Uh, vary from branch to branch to branch, but usually we're at about 55% or less um, on direct labor for our revenue. Um, uh, you know, and and with that again, I, I don't focus a ton on on the actual dollar amounts. The percentage is really what I'm looking for there. Uh, direct overtime labor percentage. Obviously, we want to make sure you know and keep an eye on that. Janitorial supplies is another one. Um, you know, it's about two and a half percent of the revenue we bring in uh, that we spend on janitorial supplies, and we want to make sure we keep that at or below that number. Uh, this one may be odd for some, but something that I love to look at is, uh, our, you know, the the amount of money that that as a company we're spending on the 401k plan match, because that number tells me, you know, how many of our people are are you know taking advantage of this benefit. Right, because this is a benefit that we want our, our folks to, to take advantage of. And so I keep an eye on that. And then the big one, and, and Jordan mentioned this, and you know, for most companies, this is what it's about, uh, you know, profit percentage. And so uh, on average at the branch level, and I wanna make sure that's made clear at the branch level, not net company profit, but just at the branch level, you know, ideally all of our branches would run at 
you know, between 20 and 25 percent uh, profit, you know, monthly. And so those those would probably be the the main, uh, you know, the main categories, the main numbers that I'm looking at, percentages that I'm looking at on the P&L. But, uh, you know, I, I think what's important is that you have so whoever's, you know, a, uh, overseeing the PL, you want to make sure they're paying attention to every line item and uh, you know they're a hawk and so uh, but those primarily the ones that I mentioned those are the ones that I'm really focusing on because I think those are the ones that are gonna you know either drive your profit percentage up or down so no, that's good that's really good that's that's helpful all right, so let's let's move on to and this and Stephen this is gonna be a little bit similar to the question that uh that we just asked you but are, are there certain kpis that you're looking at on a regular basis and maybe the best place we could start is um i know there's a new we've we've got a new uh incentive program out there now that's measuring a handful of things so maybe let's talk about the the, the things we're measuring currently that we're, we're incentivizing based on okay yeah so uh in the past just to kind of give you a little bit of background in the past for you know all the years that I'd worked here up until this year, really the only thing that we incentivized was profit. Uh, and what we found is that we created monsters, um, just people that, you know, they were willing to basically do whatever to uh, to ensure that their profit margins were high. And that, that wasn't the best approach. And so we stepped back, you know, towards the end of last year and into the beginning of this year and just said, what are the things that matter most to us as a company? Um, and what are the things we want to, you know, keep an eye on? And so naturally, the first one is uh, that we measure is profit percentage, but it's profit percentage versus the goal that we set uh, for each branch at the beginning of the year. And so that's a twofold um, category. And what I mean by that is, you know, because it's versus the goal, if a branch loses business throughout the course of the year, they're not going to exceed um their the profit margins that they want they're not going to exceed their goal so it's measuring lost business but it's also measuring you know profit percentage um and so we incentivize that uh the second thing is customer satisfaction um we could have great profit margins but if our customers are not satisfied that yeah you know, that's going to be short-lived and uh we won't be in business long so uh you know we're measuring customer satisfaction and we we use um some some tools uh, that that uh, team software provides to us and and all of our managers have the eHub mobile app and using the checkpoint uh, widget uh, I think that's the 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 right word but uh, the the checkpoint uh, widget in team it allows us to create a customer survey questionnaire and so our branch managers uh, we select ten to twelve customers each month. For every branch um, our regional managers determine which customers those are and so they go out and uh, basically ask just a few questions we don't want to take up a ton of their time but essentially overall you know one to five how satisfied are you with our service and uh, they'll respond to that with with their rating we we document that uh, the second thing that we ask is um, just overall communication how well are we responding um, are we easily accessible? Uh, if you have issues, how quickly are they being uh, addressed? So, uh, and then the, the one of the other questions we ask is if you were approached by another um, person in a similar role, would you refer France basically? And so that's, mm -hmm. we use that data just to kind of, to, to help determine our, you know, if somebody that we were approaching to try to get their business would, would, of all of our customers, which one would be willing to give a good reference? And so that would be our customer uh, satisfaction. So we're measuring that. And then the third one is just turnover percentage. And the turnover percentage is specific to each manager. And so we're 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 trying to create the culture that it, we want to keep folks in house. We do not want them starting and two weeks later leaving. So those are the three things. Um, that we're we're measuring regularly. Uh, we're keeping an eye on daily, weekly, monthly, and annually, uh, and then incentivizing. You know, uh, we do that every quarter. So based on the results quarterly, we pay out uh, pretty significant bonuses um, to our managers, and and that's been well received. And and you know, we're one quarter in, and uh, so we haven't got a ton of 
data yet, but hopefully by the end of the year, we can see that that's been fruitful and uh, we can see some of those numbers, uh, you know, get better. So Yeah. And the idea is that your KPIs are going to, it's going to be like your, your own physical health, right? So you, you would do a lot of tests to determine whether or not your health is good. So, you know, it's not just your blood pressure or just your cholesterol or, you know, just your weight or your height or your BMI, like it's, it's all of that together. So in the same way, you want to be measuring or, or talking about things that promote the overall health of the organization. So that's going to be, you know, things like turnover, things like profit, things like customer satisfaction. Um, those, those are all going to be the types of metrics. So what I would um, encourage you guys to do is you're thinking about KPIs and maybe even incentivizing based on them is to figure out what are the things that are important to you as an organization and then figure out how can we measure that. So, hey, Stephen, let me back up here real quick. I had a couple of questions uh, regarding, uh, and I, I don't want to miss these now. You, you talked about profit on the branch level. So what, and someone wanted to know if there was any overhead included in that. So what we mean by profit on the branch level is we, um, we break it down such that you can see all of the revenue and expenses that go along with one particular branch. So it would be it, the way we track it, it'd be sort of like a franchise. So like if there's a Chick-fil-A, you know, in my town of Owensboro and another one in Nashville, we can look at how each of those perform separately before you remove or pay out any money to, to corporate as it were. So our numbers of, I don't know, Stephen, what are they like 20% that we're trying to hit? At the branch yeah, level, yeah, it ranges yeah, between twenty to twenty-five. Yeah, yeah. So those numbers are at the branch level. That's that's not any overhead taken out of it. So and then and somebody else had asked about um, uh, separating out like chemicals and consumables because Stephen had talked about extra bill work and had selling consumables and liking to be at a certain percent. What we've done is we've got several revenue line items. So for all of you guys that are members in our mastermind group, I send out our company P and L's once a month. So you'll be able to see this on there, but we have our ordinary income and then we have our tag work income or our extra bill income. And then we have uh, supply resale income. So we're able to track um, how each of those three things compares to overall revenue to see if we're hitting those numbers Stephen talked about. So our chemicals is an expense that's a separate, it's under janitorial supplies, mm -hmm. but then we also have resale supplies. It's another line item on the P&L. So we just break that stuff out. Uh, Stephen, what sort of um, per turnover percent are we trying to hit with each of the managers? I know this is a touchy one because it's really difficult right now, but yeah no yeah it's a it's definitely a tough uh <laughs> tough employee market um so basically what we've done is um you know we're we're looking at it by quarter so these numbers may not um uh, they, they'll make sense um so anywhere between 20 percent and under is going to be 120 120 percent of our payout Okay, so we've established kind of a, a, a dollar amount that we're going to pay out. And so uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's 24 to 25% would equate to, um, I think, 80% of our dollar amount payout that we've determined. Anything higher than 25% per quarter would equate to a $0 payout. Um, and then if you get in the 22 to 23 range, we're going to pay out 100% of the dollar amount that we've determined. And then anything less than 20% turnover for a manager would equate to 120% of the payout for that dollar amount that we've established. And, and if I'm not mistaken, guys, uh, that number that we've determined, and it varies from position to position, but just for our area manager role, just to give you guys an idea of what I'm talking about, that baseline number is, is about $300 for that particular category. So again, if they're between, you know, 24 and 25%, they're going to get paid out 80% of that $300 uh, yeah. amount. And that's 25% for the quarter, which is a, exactly. we're shooting for under 100%. Yeah. 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 And so our, our ideal number would be 80% or less and hence the, the 20% um, goal for the 120% payout. So yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I have sent that for, for those of y'all that are in our group, I've sent a copy of that new payout, that new incentive plan to the group. And, and if you guys need a copy of that or can't find it or whatever, I can, I can resend that to you. 
uh, and you can see what that that new incentive plan looks like. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's let's move on to another question, and it's one that I'm the least excited to talk about because I really don't have a great answer for it. Um, but so, so how are we navigating and re uh, recruiting and hiring in this current economic climate? Any tips or suggestions? And, and what makes this? I mean, you all know or are painfully aware of why this is difficult. Is that it's almost like there's been this, um, you know, like a perfect storm, as it were, um, that has has come up. So we've because of COVID, they've they've the government has instituted very generous uh, unemployment benefits and have extended those benefits, um, which which you know give people an incentive not not to work. Um, and so I'm not here to debate <laughs> the the merits of that policy. <laughs> But but that's just the, the nature of the case. And then also there was stimulus money. And then we have, you know, right now we're in the midst of tax return season. And so as as we all know, most of our employee pool are people that are living paycheck to paycheck. And um, and so when you have this sort of influx of money that comes in uh, for that that demographic of people, the the employment pool just shrinks. And so you have a lot of people offering, you know, because that employment pool has shrunk now you have a lot of folks and companies you know starting wages at you know 14 15 dollars an hour and that's in a market like ours where you know starting wages a couple of years ago were going to be you know eight eight fifty an hour so steven on, on your end you know i talked to eric our our hiring manager our hr manager here at our company and um you know we don't have a silver bullet for this at this point i mean we're we're yeah. treating it sort of like the sales process in that we've got a funnel and we're trying to fill that funnel with as many applicants as possible. And we're, you know, searching from lots of different areas to try to make that happen. Um, and, you know, doing our best, we, we, we feel like we're going to need to relook at, you know, starting wages at some point and, and then how that may affect customer contracts and that sort of thing. Steven, so on your all's end, is there anything you all are doing or seeing your teams doing to help with this? Yeah, so it, just to kind of reiterate what Jordan said, it's a tough market right now. It's extremely difficult to um, to hire. It's hard to get applicants, uh, you know, in the 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 uh, proverbial funnel that he mentioned. But just some of the things that that we're doing, uh, you know, and it and it ranges from branch to branch because we're finding that in some areas it's a little better, and in, in some areas it's a little worse. But we're 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 looking at the referral bonuses that we that we throw out to potential uh, team members. And so for a long time, what we were doing is we would offer, you know, this would range anywhere between 150 to 250 dollars. And so if a team member who works for us referred somebody else to the company, uh, the referrer and the referee would both be paid um, that that referral bonus. And um, so we've we've looked at increasing that slightly in certain markets that we're having more difficult more difficulty hiring. Um, it, you know we're tinkering around a little bit with some of our starting pay rates, and that can be tricky because it creates some animosity within within certain branches. If you know long tenured team members realize that you know hey I've been working here for three years and these people that are starting are making the same much same amount of money as I am, and so we're being careful with how we're doing that, but we're looking at that. I think the one thing that we've been really intentional with over the last month or two is is really evaluating um, you know that annual price increase that we like to try to implement with all of our customers and if there are sites that we have not done that yet with you know in the past 12 months we're making sure that we're out in front of this we're talking with our customers we're explaining and and you know the the beauty of this is is that the majority of the customers that we work for, they they're experiencing the same thing, so there's some sympathy there. Uh, so they're allowing us to to kind of looking to look at our you know our monthly our our billing and uh, you know where where price increases are necessary, we're bumping that up, and that's not to increase margins. That's strictly to pass along to existing and ideally oncoming team members. Um, you know, we're blowing up social media with you know with with jobs, um, we we focus a lot of our attention uh, uh, with Indeed, um, you know, and at times, and this may sound a little bit crazy, but 
you know, in times like these, our customers are most important to us. And so, you know, there, there may be a period where we're going to have to compromise on some margins just to get people's, uh, you know, pay up to, to where it needs to be to get people on board. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I apologize, but I, I don't have a great answer for this one. This is just kind of a, a, a hopefully it's going to be a weather the storm type event and we get on the other side of it and things get a little bit better. But um, really, that's that's about all I've got. Yeah, no, that's good. I appreciate it. And and for those of you all that are struggling with this, and I think it was Daniel Clem that asked this question. And um, again, our base camp is going to be a great place to talk and, and share ideas um, on this. So, OK, so um, the next question is, how do you perform an evaluation for an area manager or a project manager? And and what does this look like? So. Stephen, I'm going to rely on you again here since you yeah. not, not only have you been an area manager and a project manager, but you also have been a branch manager and overseen area and project manager. So what what did that typically look like? So maybe I'll tee this up a little bit for these guys. You know, we have job descriptions in place, right, that um, sort of describe the expectations that we have. And so I think before you can do any sort of evaluation, there needs to be clear expectations that are on the table. Um, cause it's hard for someone to know how well they've done or for you to be able to give them honest feedback unless you know, you know, what the expectation is for that role. Um, so you, you can certainly find those job descriptions, um, in our course library stuff. So Steven, what, assuming we've got a position profile in place that has some expectations laid out, um, in some different categories, what, what does an evaluation look like? Yeah. So, uh, I'll just kind of piggyback off what you already said. But I think it's important to mention uh, with you, you called them a, a job description. Uh, you know, the title of ours are, are position profiles for for basically anybody in our company that's a project manager or above. We try to try to have something like that in place. But in addition to it just being a position profile, we, we make it very clear that on the right hand because it's a spreadsheet, it's a, it's just it's an Excel format. And so on the right hand side of the, the, the position profile, there's actually a review rating. So a one to five rating. And then for each area of business or you know, each job description, so to speak, that 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 has KPIs and it has metrics, there's also a section for us to provide information notes or just annual review comments. And so we provide anytime these are updated, it's very important that these get delivered to you know, the area managers, project managers. And so they're well aware that these are the things that are expected of them. These are the things that are going to be measured. And then they're also aware that at the time of their anniversary, so the anniversary of their hire date, they're going to be evaluated. Um, now, what I've tried to do over the years is we've had you know folks with us for longer periods of time as opposed to having you know we might have 30 area and or project managers and you're you know you're doing two or three of those a month potentially so what i try to do is uh, just set a certain month in the year where that's the month where our managers are going to they're going to be reviewed at, at maximum maybe two months out of the year so it's usually at the beginning of the year and right at the middle of the year uh, managers are going to have us sit down with their, um, you know, with their supervisor, and and basically we go down the list. Um, you know, just to give you a few examples, you know, we break down uh, each position by what we would call areas of business. So for an area and or project manager, that may look like quality control. It would be an area of business, and then inside of that area of business, there's going to be very specific job descriptions. So just to throw some out there, that might look like a team, you know, ensuring that team members' workspaces, uh, custodial closets are kept in neat and organized manner, um, ensuring that hands-on training of all team members is taking place initially and then on an ongoing basis. And then we have KPIs and metrics to determine how well or how poorly they're doing. Uh, another area uh, would be financial management. And then again, job descriptions within each and then KPIs and metrics that the overseer would be tracking throughout the course of the year. And so it's just a, a sit across the desk um, from that manager and it's line by line and we're rating your performance. Obviously focusing 
specifically on strengths, the things that those managers are doing well, and then trying to just, uh, you know, continue to nurture those things and build on those things and encourage that type of behavior. But then also it, these would be useless if you're not, you know, identifying some of the areas where they're weak uh, and, and pointing those out. And I think that where we're getting better um, and where we're being more intentional is there's got to be some prep work done on the front end before these happen. This can't be something you just pull out 10 minutes before and, and you know, you're sitting across the table just rating people and telling them they're great at this and poor at this, but then not providing them with an action plan. And so we're, you know, myself and another one of the regional managers here at France are, are developing, um, you know, PowerPoint courses and trainings that specifically focus on the job description so that if somebody's weak in an area, we're going to walk, they're going to walk away from that evaluation with some type of, of training material that will help better them in that area and so that's that's one time per year where those managers are they're well aware that it's coming uh they know they're gonna uh, be evaluated and they're gonna walk away with some some productive developmental type material uh so that they can be better uh so and steven we do this once a year right one time uh, per year yep yep and then but you know, on the regular, you're a good branch manager is going to be providing ongoing feedback, right? To, Absolutely. Yeah. To, so to one of the things we we do um, and have gotten much better at recently, we call them debriefs. Um, and so our branch managers at minimum are, are meeting with their area and our project managers at least every other week. Ideally, it would be weekly uh, where they're just sitting across the, the desk and, and going over you know, day to day, um, you know, job description items, you know, how are things going, staffing, uh, any issues in customer locations, you know, we're able to, to track deficiencies based off of checkpoints that have been completed. And so, yeah, we're regularly meeting uh, just debriefs with all of our folks at least every week, if not every other week. And then annually, there's a there's kind of a formal review that we do. Um, yeah, gotcha. All right, good deal. So this is a uh, Mike Eller actually asked this question, and um, and so he they're having a discussion at their company about whether an area manager can oversee accounts that are cleaned on like both first and second shift. So, you know, our our model, Stephen, that I've shared with our group is that you know the managers uh, oversee customer relations and then they oversee their team in the evenings. So, do we have managers that are overseeing? accounts that are cleaned during the day that all and then also have accounts that are cleaned at night or do we typically try to you know portion off all the day cleaning accounts and have a manager that oversees all those and then everybody else is on second shift what, what does that look like for us yeah so that's changed a little bit over the years but i think we finally got i, I feel like we've gotten it right just in the past couple of years uh, that was a big issue for me when i first came on board is you know i, I realized the stress um, and the pressure that's, that, that can be put on a manager if they're overseeing and, and totally overseeing first and second, and in a lot of cases, even third shift operations. Uh, we may have a manager who, who takes care of 10 or 11 facilities, but when you stop and think about it, a lot of those facilities are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's, you know, it's, it's just all the time. And a manager never feels like they have, you know, time off. And so uh, what we've come to the conclusion on is that yes, it is okay for an area manager to oversee multiple shift accounts, but it's imperative that if they are in a situation like that, there has to be a team coordinator in place. And so I, and I, I'm fairly familiar with some of the other businesses in our industry. Um, and I think our team coordinator would probably be equivalent to some of the supervisors that other companies have out there. So they understand that their expectation would be, I'm responsible for the off shifts, checking on the work, ensuring that if call-ins take place, they fill in those spots. Uh, a lot of times they're delivering supplies, those types of things. Whereas our, our area manager, they're primarily responsible for for cultivating and nurturing that relationship with our customer contact. They oversee, um, in a lot of cases, they're overseeing, you know, contractual obligations. Uh, they're tracking timekeeping, they're, you know, they're reviewing financials. 
those types of things. Um, and then, you know, obviously they're, they're, they're developing relationships with our team members, but they're not responsible for those calls that happen on the off shifts. So whenever their day is over at four o'clock or five o'clock in the day, when they go home, they have already, they have something implemented where there's a person in place to take care of the off shift issues. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how we have, 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 figured out how to manage that. And it seems to be working really well in the branches where we've implemented the team coordinator position. So. Okay, perfect. No, that's, that's a great answer. And Mike, if you'd like to dive in on that a little bit further, we, we certainly can. And you, this, this webinar will be for all of our group members, it will be recorded and, and I'll send out an email. You'll have access to, to this again, to rewatch. So, Okay, so th I'll take this question here. So um, I think it was Evelyn that asked this question. Uh, what key positions do you want to hire for when you hit certain revenue levels? So, or maybe another way to ask this, what, what sort of, um, uh, what sort of key positions, I guess, should, should you have like a checklist for that? Hey, at, at some point, this is our first one we're going to hire. This is our next one we're going to hire. So part of that will depend, I think, in, in turn, in, part of it will depend on your skill set as an owner or a leader. So sometimes owners are, uh, you know, if you started the company, you're really good at sales. <clears throat> and so it's very possible that you will lead the sales efforts for a long time. So maybe, you know, past three, four, five million dollars. <clears throat> but it may be that you are very strong operationally and you're not a salesperson. And so, um, you know, it, getting a salesperson may be one of the first key hires that you do. So, so part of this will depend on your skill set. So for instance, in, you know, in our case, uh, um, and again, there's a webinar that I did that shares the story of our company um, that's available to the group. And I think it's in the course library. If you look at some of the webinars that we did from in 2020, I think it was on that, that list um, where I go through the story of our company and I, I did a timeline of when we did all of our key hires and, and the associated revenue that we were at at that time. So, um, when we were a $2 million company, basically what we had was, um, we had an office administrator and, and a controller and we had a few supervisors and an operations manager. Um, and I was doing sales, um, and my dad was was overseeing operations at that time. And so we didn't really have a full time salesperson um, until until we were probably four and a half million dollars or so in revenue. Um, someone that was just solely dedicated to that. Um, so and then when Brian Lewis came on board, he's who's now our company president. He started out as a branch manager and, he, you know, he became our VP of operations or overseeing all operations, probably when we were in the five to $6 million range. Um, and then we brought on an HR uh, generalist or an HR manager, um, probably when we were around four and a half or $5 million. So the, the sort of the sales uh, person and the HR person sort of came on board about that time. You know, if I had to go back and, and do it again, I would say, getting somebody in to do recruiting and HR stuff probably should have happened earlier. I mean, that, that probably should have happened at the two to $3 million number. Um, but we were all just wearing a lot of hats at that time. So that was sort of the way that worked for us. Um, and, you know, really that's it. I mean, there's not, as you think about key positions in the company, ours, as we've grown, um, our growth has been geographic. And so there, for us, a lot of it has just been replication of, of the way we did things in one area, we did it in another area. So Steven's position is, is a new position. It's he's overseeing an entire territory from an operations standpoint. Um, and that's sort of been the natural outgrowth of uh, the fact that we've grown over the last, the last few years. So Evelyn, if I, if I can help you with that question any further or more in depth, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Okay. And last question here and Steven, I got a, a couple things I, want to pick your brain on here. So yeah. um, one of our one of our newer members asked about, you know, okay, how do I pick like a platform or technology to help us run our business on? Um, and, you know, what are some things to consider? So, you know, Stephen has mentioned we use team, which is a big part of what we do. Um, and, but there are also a lot of other good platforms. I mean, one of our uh, mastermind members is Ricky Regalado. And um, Ricky has, created a company called route and it's a really neat uh, 
technology platform that's designed for our industry. It's got a lot of cool functionality. Um, Swept is another uh, platform out there. So a lot of good, you know, good platforms, to, things to think about. So the the problem that I see, and then Stephen, I can get your thoughts on it, is owners like myself, we love the idea of some cool flashy technology to help us. Um, mm -hmm. And but at the end of the day, I think a lot of people out in the field get frustrated, like they, their preference would be, uh, you know, as little headache as necessary for me to get my job done. So Stephen, I guess as we've implemented different things over the years, you know, we've done concur and we've had, you know, some of the team mobile stuff like is what is the operational feel towards using technology? Like, is it, is it something people like to partake in or is it like, is it seen as a headache? Like what's, cause I think this yeah. is a big part of deciding what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the key is, it, you know, it's, it's really what it boils down to is change. Uh, and, and what happens a lot of times in the, in the, in the field, people just assume change with, oh, you're giving me more work, right? So you, you're giving me more things to be responsible for. And so what we've tried to do, you know, over the years as we've implemented new technologies or new platforms or those types of things, it's really important that we communicate it well. And so the leaders, you know, in each area, they have to be sold on the, the change that we're making to the communication, right? And so how it's communicated to our team is super important. But I think more than anything, when you decide to make a change and go to a, a tech platform, it's really important, I think, that it that it increases the efficiency of whatever you're doing. But specifically, if there's a, you know, concur, you mentioned that example. I mean, you know, in the past we were, you know, having to track receipts throughout the course of a month, half the time you're losing them, you know, you're, you're writing things down or you're plugging things into a spreadsheet. And so when you make a change, you want to make sure that it makes that person's job easier, right? It makes it more efficient uh, and it may, it just, at the end of the day, it makes it easier for the manager. And I think when you make changes like that, uh, it's received a lot better. And the, again, the key is how it's communicated to those folks. Um, you don't want that us versus them mentality and that, yep, hey, they're deciding to, you know, we're, we're moving over here to this and, it, you know, that that's not a good way to communicate those things. Um, but I think the key is just as you consider those things, make sure that they're they're going to make, you know, the manager's job more efficient and make make whatever process you're trying to transfer over to, to technology, make sure that it, it makes it easier for them to use. Um, but yeah, you know, as as technologies become more prevalent in in our industry and in the workforce daily, uh, I, I think it's at, at least at the manager level it's received well. Um, when you try to get down into the team member level, that that gets a little dicey just because you've got a wide variety of folks out there. Some who can, some who can't, some who probably can use the certain tech, but they just don't want to change. Um, but I think it's just at the manager level, it's it's uh, it's become the norm. I think everybody's pretty used to stuff like this by now. Um, but anyway. Yeah, no, that's that good. Fun. That's good. And I, I, maybe the last comment that I would add to that is um, make sure that whatever you do is something that you can scale with. <clears throat> so what you don't want to do is uh, get something on board. And then if you grow by 20 percent or 50 percent or 100 percent, whatever it is, and it's going to make that particular piece of technology, you know, outdated or not work for you guys anymore. It's probably not a good fit. So always keep in mind, okay, here's where I want to be in five years and ask yourself the question, not only is this going to make us more efficient now, but is it going to, is it going to grow with us over time so that you're not making changes? Absolutely. So, all right, well, listen, this gets to the end of it. Steven, I appreciate you uh, being willing to, to chat with us. I feel like your insight is always helpful. Um, because you've lived in some of those shoes and uh you know and that's something you're doing every day so it's super yeah. helpful so guys if there's um any additional follow-up questions that you you have for me i'm certainly happy to um to answer any of those you can reach me by email uh jordan at elite business coaching .net. um again you can search the course library you guys i send links out to that um, to that course library all the time. Um, and there's tons of webinars and videos, everything that we do, every piece of content that we create, we house it there. 
Um, and again, I'd encourage you to be on base camp and uh, engage with people um, and engage with your peers on there. And if I can, can help you at all with setting up a coaching call, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, would love to do that. Love to chat with you and, and help you figure out how to get where you want to go. So, all right, well, listen, this, that wraps this up. Um, I appreciate everybody being in attendance and um, I look forward to chatting with some of you guys uh, in the future. Have a great rest of the week. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.